come and chat to you again. Now before I start, I have a bit of a confession to make. Well, I love these cupcakes events and I'm constantly amazed at the beautiful creations that you all come up with. Something about cupcakes just doesn't sit right with me. Now don't shoot me just yet. Let me explain what I mean. See, I know that Sue and Jane have gone to all this trouble to choose a good mixture, a good tasting cupcake. And yet, um, if you ate them right now, they would taste completely amazing. But I wonder how many of you, like me, uh, once you spend all that time cutting up little butterflies and dyeing the icing and getting these beautifully decorated cupcakes, it just feels like a bit of a waste to eat them straight away. So I keep them for a few days. I show them off to my friends and I take pictures of them and I post them on Instagram and I just enjoy their general beauty. And they make me happy for a few glorious days. And then I realize that it's probably time to eat them. So I pick up this beautiful piece of art and I take a huge bite, but of course it's gone stale by then and it doesn't taste good at all. And I throw the rest of them out and it's a waste, right? Its purpose is gone completely unfulfilled. I mean, was it meant to be decorative or was it meant to be edible? And I think, what was the point of it all? Why did I bother? I wonder if you've ever felt a bit like that about your own life, about your own purpose. What's this whole doing life thing all about? We work hard and we strive so hard, building good marriages, raising happy kids, getting promotions, keeping the house clean, getting the bank balance in the black. But what's it all for? What's the point in the end? And yet we can't stop the treadmill long enough to think about it because yes, the kids do have to be fed. And yes, the bills do have to be paid. And so the question remains unanswered. Our lives look amazing on the outside, but maybe just like a two day old cupcake, they're stale on the inside and we're struggling to remember what the point of it all is. Well, my friend Alison was one of those people whose lives did look beautiful just like a cupcake. She married the love of her life. She owned her own home. She traveled, she had a job she loved, and she kept an impeccably clean home. She was fit and athletic, and at 29, her joy almost overflowed when she found out she was pregnant with her first child. However, towards the end of her pregnancy, she was discovered to have cancer. And over the past three years, I have watched her battle cancer, and I've watched her take stock of her purpose, of what's important in her life. And tonight, she had planned to come and talk to you all about her faith and about what kept her going. However, just two short months ago, cancer took her life. And if you'll permit me, I'd like to share with you a little about my beautiful owl and about her journey and some of the things I think she would have told you if she was here tonight. Alison and I are friends when we were 18. And after moving to a new church and trying to break into a new group of friends, she made me feel welcome. And pretty quickly, we discovered that we had a lot in common. We liked the same music, we liked the same movies, and people even thought we looked alike and were constantly mistaking us for each other. We became inseparable pretty quick and we spent ages hanging out with each other. We had lots of fun together, and I have so many wonderful things of the silly things we got up to. Like this time, um, when we had a competition to see who could fit the most grapes in their mouths. Um, it's a pretty embarrassing shot of both of us, but I'm pretty sure that Al won. Well at 23, Al met her Prince Charming Luke and they were married in 2004. Their wedding was picture perfect and it was an honor to be a bride. And after, um, Luke, was, sorry, Luke was a country boy from Wagga Wagga and after they married, Alison moved to Wagga so they could start their new life together. And even though she lived five hours away, we still talked on the phone constantly and we tried to visit each other as much as possible. And so I was so overjoyed when she told me that she was expecting a baby to, born in, to be born in June 2009. Her life was so together. She had it all. However, towards the end of her pregnancy, Al had some blood pressure issues and was taken to hospital. And it was then that the cancer was discovered. And by then, the cancer had already spread like wildfire through her body. It, first, it was first discovered in her liver, and then it was found to be in her breast and her bone and the baby's placenta. Imagine the weight of that. This wonderful life, all mapped out, going to plan. And then in one moment, like a nuclear bomb went off in the middle of your life, scattering it, all your hopes and your dreams and your plans a million miles away. Instead of looking forward to her baby growing up and going to school and getting married, she was now just hoping to make it to her baby's first birthday. Alison's picture perfect life lay in tatters. And yet when I visited her in the hospital after receiving the news, it was so clear that all was not lost in her mind. The things that mattered in her life, 
the things that gave her purpose still remained. She believed wholeheartedly in a God who loved her and she loved him. This God who sacrificed his own son to be in a relationship with her. And she knew that this God of such outrageous love was with her in this situation. And that gave her peace and comfort. Her purpose wasn't tied up in the pretty things of life, but it was tied up in loving and trusting the God of the Bible. And that's just what she did. See, she was scheduled for a C-section the day after they received the news. And the baby was to be delivered and then the doctors were going to straight away do some expository surgery to find out how far, how far the cancer had spread. Al was really disappointed that she wouldn't get to have a normal birth. And when waking up from the procedure, the joyous news of her baby, um, baby's arrival would be marred by the doctor's findings. So she prayed to the God that she loved and that whom she knew loved her. And God heard her prayers and he gave her just the miracle she had prayed for. And Ella Jade made her arrival into the world six weeks early, but by completely natural labour in the early hours of the morning that the procedure was supposed to take place. And Ella was completely adorable and healthy. And in those early days in the hospitals, we were filled with such joy and happiness as Alison thanked God for this precious little gift that she'd been given. And for the next two years, Al got on with normal life. She raised her precious girl. She worked part time. She had chemotherapy and radio. She had pain. She lost her beautiful thick hair. And if anyone's watched anyone do chemo knows, it wasn't always pretty. But she kept up a pretty normal existence. And most of the time I forgot that she even had cancer. I was in Wagga a bit during this time and people would constantly come up to me and ask me, you know, how could Al do it? How did she keep going? How did she keep this normal life going while inside her body was growing this cancer? But Al wasn't some hero. She wasn't a, you know, superhuman. She told me again and again when I asked her why she wasn't a blubbering mist, that it was God who gave her the strength to keep going. He gave her the peace that meant that she didn't need to worry about what happened in the next six months, or what happened in the next six years. But she knew that God knew what happened next and that he was in control. And all that she had to do was trust that he knew what was best. And trust she did. Often when we spoke of her cancer, she would turn the conversation back to God and, and his goodness to her, even in her illness. She relied on God heavily to, at this time. And true to every one of his promises, he saw her through the ups and the downs of a battle with cancer. Well, Ella turned one and then two. And Al delighted in every day that she was given to be a mum. I was staying with Luke and Al in April this year while Al was having some chemo. And for the first time I got a taste of how really sick she was. She was regularly nauseous, walking was painful, and lifting Ella had become so painful that it was now impossible. And she was really, really tired. But she was still Al and we had some really special times. And we had some opportunities in that month to talk about the hard stuff about Ella's, Ella's future, about her pain, and about death. Al was still playing, praying for a miracle, and we both believed, and I still do now, that God could heal her completely if that was part of his plan. And we talked about what would happen if God didn't heal her. And she knew without a shred of doubt that God was real, and that he had been with her through every step of her journey. And she knew that he would follow through on the promises in his word, that if she did die, that he would take her to heaven to be with him, and that God would also take care of Luke and Ella. That's not to say we didn't shed tears. We did. But they weren't tears of utter devastation. They were tears with hope. And after that visit, things went downhill pretty fast. The cancer spread to Alison's brain, and despite some aggressive radiotherapy, she began to slip away from us. She was able to come home and be with her family, and even through the pain and fatigue, she was generous in giving comforting words and big smiles. Her last good day, where she was up and around and chatting and smiling, was on Ella's third birthday. And after that, I was pretty much bedridden, until on the 3rd of June, she peacefully left this world, surrounded by the people she loved, to be with her God in heaven. Her battle with cancer and her death was so different from many other people's last days. It's been an agonizing time and I miss her terribly, as any of you that have lost anyone would know. 
There's something really different about Al's last days and her funeral. See, we were sad, but we were also at peace. For Alison had lived a wonderful life, but you couldn't see this by looking at a life from the outside. It wasn't her house, her husband, her job, or even Ella that gave her this life with stuff substance. It was her trust and faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. She believed that this book contained the very words of God, and that is what made her life different. That is what gave her substance and purpose. And even now that her life, her earthly life is done, these things are not. Have you ever thought about what your last days will be like? Now I know that we're Aussies and we're not meant to talk about death, but when your best friends just died, you sort of can't help it. See, the Bible says that each of us will stand personally before God one day and give an account of our lives to God. To God. What we stood for, what we did, and what we didn't do. Now you would think on that day that my owl would coast right through with a pat on the back from God. I mean, she was a very good person. She was a devoted mother. She helped people in need. She was a wonderful, faithful wife and a fantastic friend. But God isn't looking for good people. He is perfect and just. And because of this sense of justice, he can't tolerate even an ounce of sin, which means that we would all fail. Al would fail, you would fail, and I most certainly would fail. So how do we find a way to a relationship with God and an eternity with God, to a peace and trust in God just like Al had? Well, there's no self-help books, there's no money needed, and there's no trying just a little bit harder. See, it's all in one word, or one person actually, Jesus. See, Jesus says here in the Bible, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus came into the world to show us, to tell us the way to God, but he also made the way. Jesus was crucified to show us the depths of God's love for us, to personally pay the cost for our rejection of God, and to overcome all the barriers separating us from God. And then God physically raised Jesus to life, opening the door for us to have a genuine relationship with him and a real hope for life now and in eternity. That, friends, is the way to God. This is the only truth in the world that really matters. And when one truly believes this truth, follows in this way, then and only then can real, all-encompassing, all-fulfilling life in this life and the next be found. See, my owl believed that. And God gave her unbelievable strength and peace in her battle with cancer and in her death. That is what life is all about. And that is what will bring you fulfillment and purpose. Now, if you're just even the slightest bit interested in what I've said tonight or about the Christian faith, don't squash it back down and move on. Take some time to check it out for yourself. Decide if there is truth in Jesus' words. And one of the best ways you can do that is to read the Bible for yourself. Find out who Jesus was and what he said. Why not meet at a coffee shop once a fortnight with the woman that you came here with tonight and read the Bible together to ask the hard questions that are swimming around in your head. I can promise you that she would love to talk with you about her faith because it's just as important to her as it was to Alice and it is to me and when you love something that much, you want to talk about it. So take that step, pick up that Bible and grasp hold of Jesus as the one and abundant life now and in eternity. Thanks for your